Hi everyone, welcome to Tomasek Life Sciences Accelerator from Singapore. I'm Henry, your host and moderator. Established in 2016, TLA is a joint venture between Tomasek Life Sciences Laboratory and Vertex Venture Holdings. We incubate, nurture and grow disruptive life sciences innovations into early stage companies. Our team of professionals are experienced in effective lab to market strategies. We are committed to future-proving aquaculture applications with food security capabilities. Globally, population growth poses great challenges to sustaining a supply of high-quality, nutrient-rich foods. By 2050, demand of animal protein, including seafood, projected to rise by 52%. Notably, fisheries are turning to aquaculture to fill supply gaps caused by plateauing volumes of wild capture fish. In fact, aquaculture is the fastest-growing food production sector by annual growth rates over the last 30 years. Recently, the COVID-19 pandemic has woken us up to vulnerable supply chains, trade disruptions, limiting food access, and increasing seafood prices. In light of a rapid changing climate, can the strained food fish system still be capable of providing sustainable proteins to 10 billion people in 30 years' time? Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guest speakers for today. Andreas is the CEO at Baramundi Asia, a Singapore-based end-to-end aquaculture company. It operates its own hatchery, nursery, grow-out deep sea pens, farm-to-fork online retail platform, as well as animal health and vaccine laboratory, with in-situ animal health monitoring regimes and access to superior fish genetics. Our second speaker for today, Richard, is the director for Commercial Strategy Aquaculture Thermosate Life Sciences Laboratory. He's leading a new team. He's developing better fish feed aquaculture and researching tools that advance aquaculture in urban and rural settings. Andreas, could you share with us some observation on how aquaculture has taken shape in our region? In particularly, how do you supply sustainable fish protein from farm to table? Generally, Asia Pacific is a very diverse region uh, and it's by far the most significant region for aquaculture production uh, worldwide, worldwide as, it, as it really stands for the lion's share of, of global production. I think the number is quite, quite, quite astonishing. Around 65 million tons of, of, of aquatic animals is produced, uh, which accounts to almost 90% of the global production. So, and, and I think that it really spreads across a, a great variety of different species. I think um, around more than 200 different species are being, are being farmed in, 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 in across Asia Pacific. Um, and I think what, what I think is, is characteristic about, uh, I mean, I've been traveling around uh, the, the different countries and the, the predominant, I would say, volume comes from uh, the brackish and freshwater uh, fisheries like like um, uh, pangasius, catfish, carps, uh, shrimp, and um, and I think but I think increasingly we've seen more growth from the mariculture. For example, Paramundi, uh, where we, we are one of the you know more industrialized companies uh, that have really aimed to to do a more technological driven uh, aquaculture production using the proven technologies that we know from salmon, applying that for, for, for our operations in both Singapore, Australia, and, and soon also Brunei. Um, a lot of the, the, the sort of the, the bulk uh, is still with, I would say the small type farmers, uh, the non-industrialized, very fragmented. Uh, but I think we are, we are seeing a, a, a trend that it's becoming more and more professional uh, as, as, as I think companies are evolving. We are applying a, a multi-site uh, ocean-based based aquaculture uh, system, uh, where we, uh, I think, apply the, the same methodologies across different sites. Uh, and, and that enables us really to, to produce sustainable barmundi and that we farm uh, in quite light, large sizes, four to five kilograms. Richard. Could you tell us what farm science is doing to enhance the economic equation of food fish? How can we grow more fish protein sustainably? How farm science is, is, is helping right now is uh, quite diverse. Uh, if you look at the, um, the, the science itself, the publications that are, are for the last years, uh, 
every year uh, uh, on aquaculture. There are probably 4,000, 5,000, uh, and you, you will find mainly three topics. The first one is usually genetics, gene expression. When you look at really the, the database of articles, this is what comes out. Uh, I checked recently. Um, and you have this genetics and gene expression that is, is quite important. The second one will be the, um, all the work around, about pathogens and uh, immunology, uh, disease resistance, and these type of things. And the third one will be water quality. So I think it, it represents quite well what is the, the, uh, the, the, the most important right now in, in the industry. Uh, in the same time, to be honest, the most funny part, the funniest part here is more in the interactions between these domains. Uh, the interaction between uh, nutrition and genetics, the interaction between the microbiome uh, and the environment, the interaction between the systems and the, and the disease. So I think a lot of people right now and a lot of scientists in the world are focusing on, the, on, this, on these interaction domains, uh, uh, which is of high interest. And I think what is also very important and sometimes difficult to see is all the hidden science. I like the fact that you, you talk about farm science because this is really farm science. Uh, mm. uh, I think there is a lot of uh, hidden exchanges between the scientific labs and scientists and, and the farmers. If you ask the farmers around the world, they, they will tell you that they, they, they usually have a, a contact uh, that they used to exchange with about some questions. And these discussions are, are going in, in, in other directions. Uh, and I think this is quite important because this is the only way to make the big numbers, like the flip conversion ratio that is high, that is very good in, in, in aquaculture, uh, the, 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 the consumption of water, um, the, the, the CO2 uh, equivalent emission. They are good numbers, but the most difficult is to maintain these numbers on a daily basis. And that's mm -hmm. the challenge of a farmer is to get up every morning and look at the FCR and say, okay, it's compatible with what I expected. So this day-to-day -day mm -hmm. relationship is sometimes difficult to see because aquaculture is unstable by definition and science is a good partner to, 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 make, to help uh, stabilize that. Andreas, from a fish farm's perspective, could you share how scientific research is applied? How are we growing more with less? I would just echo a lot of, uh, of the things that, that Richard just mentioned. So really uh, genetics, biotechnology, in, in this case, for, for our case, vaccines, and nutrition uh, are, are really the, the, the core components uh, that, that we apply. So I think what, what, to start with genetics, what Barramundi Asia acquired uh, the deep tech startup Allegro Aqua in, in the earlier part of this year, which is an, an, a company incubated by Thematic Life Sciences Accelerator, um, where we got access to a, a, a very unique special breed of, of Barramundi seed stock. Uh, that is both uh, faster growing and, and more re disease resistant. So I think this is one of the key elements of, of how we continue to improve our, our performance uh, in, in the farm. The second part is on biotechnology where we use vaccines. We have a proprietary vaccines company called Uvax where we do autogenous vaccines that protect the fish in the lifespan uh, that, that they, they are in, in the ocean up to two years. Um, mm. and I think finally on nutrition, this is always, I mean, feed is, remains the biggest cost component for, for a fish farming company. So uh, any one percentage improvement we can get on, on the feed conversion ratio will, will have, have tremendous impact on our operation. This is also where we continue to, to innovate. Uh, we have applied a proprietary growth model and allows us to distribute feed in the most e efficient way. And we also do research on continuing um, improving on the feed and the performance of the feed. Um, and, and we have a number of, of ongoing projects related to that as well. So that continues to be, uh, you know, some of the key areas that we focus on. Andreas, back to you again. Could you share with us how Barramundi Asia coped with supply chain disruption during COVID-19 as the pandemic continued to unfold how would it affect fish food production? A very um, good question. And, and I think we've been through a very, uh, I would say turbulent time over the last uh, six to nine months with really adapting to a new reality. I would say that from the very beginning, we, we were very unsure about how this whole thing would, would unfold. But uh, of course, I mean, we have a lot of our sales were directed to, to the hotels and restaurants prior to the pandemic. And, and we saw a complete stop 
in in the orders coming in from 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 from, from that sector. So I think very fortunate. Uh, for, for us, we have a, a, a direct-to-consumer platform where we are able to sell directly to, to consumers. You can appreciate that uh, as the whole world almost turned to the internet to, to get hold of their food supplies, so did uh, our customers. Instead of going to the restaurants that were all but closed, uh, they now ordered online. So in, instead of spending the money at restaurants, they decided to uh, treat themselves even better with, 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 with eating good food at home. And to cook um, now. And to cook. There's a lot of... Uh, I would say logistical challenges in pivoting our focus from being very horeca based to to all of a sudden be, be, be focused on the e-commerce with an increased amount of, of logistical challenges, delivery trucks, etc. So, I think that, that, but I think that that's how we coped. In, in the short horizon, I think there has been a, a, a quite big impact on 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 on, on fish consumption uh, in, in the world uh, because of the sheer closures of 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 a lot of the outlets that that you know that that used to pick up a lot of fish but we have seen the retail uh, segment growing very fast and also the direct to consumer now i think if you look at a bit of on the longer term horizon i would certainly say that i think actually the, the pandemic has been quite good for, for aquaculture and for fish in, in general because what what has happened is really that more people are, are asking about you know food good for the for the world they have appreciated that the world is a fragile place uh, so I think now that they're, they're asking even more about how can I eat more sustainably? How can I live more healthy myself? So we've actually seen trends in both the US and UK where consumers are starting to eat much more fish than they did before the pandemic. So I think actually it's, it's some of the mega trends that we are seeing that, uh, that has been accelerated through this, uh, this pandemic that uh, people want to eat more healthy, uh, eating more fish and, and not only just fish, but the sustainably farmed fish is becoming more important. So I think I'm actually very optimistic in the longer run once we've gotten through this pandemic. Richard, the challenges in achieving food security remain urgent. How are research institutions like Domestic Life Sciences Laboratory tackling the need to beef up the protein security by 2030 with a focus on aquaculture? Domestic Lab Science Laboratory is working on in really different topics from the insect to human to, uh, uh, to fish. Um, uh, mainly on, on, on these topics that will be impactful for the area. But in aquaculture, um, our main role has been to be as close as possible to the industry these past years, starting with genetics a, lot, a few years ago, as Andreas mentioned, uh, trying to improve the rootstocks that will be the future and that are now the, the, the present of the industry. So that, that was very important to start there. And now I'm really happy to be with Andreas today because we do also work together on a, on a weekly basis on, on other topics um, to, to improve what can be improved in nutrition uh, of Barramundi and, and trying to uh, identify what should be improved again. So I would say we have uh, some, some teams in, in Temasek uh, Life Science Laboratory that are really working on the, on the fundamental, fundamental science, deep science. And we try to bring uh, together this fundamental science and uh, uh, the farmers, the farmer needs. That, that's really a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day focus. And especially when it comes to interacting between different teams, we have uh, teams working on a special, only on microbiome, uh, teams working only on genetics, teams only on nutrition. Uh, the advantage we have right now to trying to address the, the, the coming issues of the, of the industry and of the world is the ability to work together to think about what can be a global solution, uh, exchange more and more information and data, and then when we are ready, we try to listen to the farmer needs and, and and supply solutions that make sense. That I think that's the most important, and that's what uh, why TLL, so the Massive Life Science Laboratory, is is quite unique, is to have this interaction between the between deep science and the, and the farmers, and we try to maintain that together with a, a strong relationship with the industry too and the startups. Uh, working on precision farming, uh, that's a, also a key for, the, for us in the future. Andreas, relying on food imports has posed greater challenges for us. How does local fish food production look like for domestic consumption in the near future? Singapore's food import strategy has been very successful uh, and is also, I think, proven to be a very effective 
during the COVID-19 pandemic. I think when it, when it first hit, everybody was very scared. I think the, the, the consumers ran to the supermarkets to hoard and, and, and get hold of, of, of critical items. But I would say that overall, uh, the, the, the country has been extremely good at, at securing a constant supply from, 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 its, from its different uh, partner countries, in, in neighboring countries. So, um, but I think the, the, there's been, a, I think, a mind shift, shift change as, as we've gone through the pandemic, not, not only in Singapore, but I think around the world, where I think food security has become a much more important topic uh, than anybody really uh, thought about before. I think Singapore has probably been very unique in, in, in having a foresight that, that even 10 years ago, food security was on the top of the agenda for, for Singapore. Now, I think as the, as the pandemic hit, uh, places like the Middle East, uh, you know, and other countries around the world have, have really felt, uh, uh, I think, a much more de higher degree of vulnerability uh, in what really happens if borders are closing, if the supply chains are cut, uh, and what do we really do. So we've actually seen quite a lot of interest from different uh, both companies and countries around the world who have been asking for, you know, what would it take to enable local production in, 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 in their respective countries. Um, so I think it's something that we will see uh, an increasing the amount of. I, I, I think it's from a, from a global trade perspective, I, I don't know what to think about it, but I do think there will be a trend that uh, consumers will ask about, you know, eating local and supporting local uh, in a much greater degree than, than, than we used to. And now uh, countries are starting to implement made in Singapore, made in the US, made in you know all kinds of made in Australia, uh, in your know, brands uh, to also encourage their uh, the, the the local uh, you know people to 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 buy and support local. Uh, so we see it also ha happening now in, in in real life. Indeed, uh, the immediate new norm for this industry shift is to you know uh, build the domestic markets, and also just now Andreas had mentioned about the e-commerce in the seafood industry. Right, so I guess uh, this will be the very significant uh, new norm that we we are seeing right now. Richard, how are we adopting our systems in land scarce cities like Singapore for tropical fish farming? In a very creative way, I would say. Uh, many many different examples uh, exist now in Singapore. Um, the transfer of this technology um, to tropical aquaculture is a, is a daily challenge, but it's an exciting challenge. And uh, if you just look at the ecosystem we have here um, these past years growing, it's uh, impressive how we, how we have recirculation system now in research facilities, where it's coming from, actually. It really started with hatcheries and, and, uh, and, uh, and research systems. So our systems uh, in TLL, uh, the systems for research on St. John Island that are also on recirculation a lot, uh, James Cook University. These type of systems are quite uh, a standard uh, design. We have more original ones like uh, uh, multi-floor systems that are growing also in the city. So to grow now aquaculture in buildings, uh, it's also exciting to see this happening. And uh, quite a unique uh, type of source of system, which is floating system, a uh, kind of intermediary between um, uh, inland production and, and cages production with uh, winter shine or uh, ACE uh, that are also trying another, another way to produce. And I think these new ways are part of the, the answer uh, Singapore is providing. It's how to um, uh, rapidly cover the learning curve, how to make this learning process fast fast in, in different uh, examples. It may be in land, it may be uh, in the sea. Uh, also uh, startups like Aqualogics that are trying to, to reinvent the, the way the, the systems are working. So I think this, this, this are the ways that it, there are challenges like the, the dimension of the, of the filter uh, in tropical environment is a challenge. The, the water uh, transfer and the temperature management is, is a transfer for RAS system here in the area for sure. We have also to face some of flavors in some environments, also a key challenge for the coming years. But altogether, having the scale of opportunities to analyze and to study is convenient. And um, in a way, it's, it's not, I mean, it's still a learning procedure, but it's a very good learning and, and science tool to, to learn more. Well, besides the key infrastructure for healthy food fish production, companies must also ensure that Consumers assess highly nutritious food products. Let's go to the audience for a very quick poll. Audience, how do you tell that seafood is fresh and safe to eat? 
you can select more than one choice and you have 10 seconds for this poll. From the poll, the top choices are safety certification, color and product labels. Interesting. Andreas, can you comment on the audience poll result? How does Brandmundi Asia meet various customer expectations? I'm mean, very happy to see those, uh, those results actually. Um, I, I think it's um, in particular when it comes to safety, uh, it's something that we, I think every, everybody around the world has, has, is, is, is asking more about now. And, and also the origins of our company, when we founded some 12 years ago, was quite a, an, a unique company in an Asian context. Our company was founded really with, with sustainability in mind. So uh, we were the company that, that set out to really produce Barmundi in a sustainable manner um, and really going on the forefront on, on that, uh, achieving all the certifications that you can get. So we are the only company that has a BAP four-star certification in Singapore. Uh, we are going for the best feed that you can that you can get. Uh, and also we are, we are very careful on, on our hospital practices, really caring for the fish. So, and that's also one of the things that led to us creating a brand where I believe, you know, a consumer needs to know where's this fish coming from, where, how it has, has it been farmed. Uh, so I think we, we, we saw that we needed to link uh, our practices that we are a very unique producer uh, with a strong brand. Uh, so we created a, a, a very strong brand uh, called Kubara in Singapore that we are now exporting to both the US, China and, and other places, which is really a testament of the quality that you get when you buy Barmundi farm in a, in a responsible, sustainable way as, 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 as we do. It was quite unique 12 years ago, but I do think now, and, and even now accelerated with the whole pandemic, we've seen that this is one of the trends that has been only accelerated uh, even further. Richard, as uh, fish has become increasingly important component of our daily animal protein intake, is it possible that food fish will lose their nutritional value over time? How can science help us to secure sustainable supplies of seafood? This uh, decrease in quality is a, is a concern in all agriculture and, and animal production. Uh, it, 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 nobody knows right now, it's a bit early to, to, to know, but there is a risk always. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, to think about it. And, and this answer about certification is very interesting because in a way, this is probably the direction we will have to go. Um, because if you look, for example, the salmon industry, mm -hmm. the definition of this standard of quality is really participating to the success of the, of the, of the, of the market. And, and I think in the 80s, 90s, they started to really, really trust in Norway to define what is a good salmon, what is a, a good quality in lipid, in color, in texture. This protocol is, is probably necessary now uh, in other species in Asia to define mm -hmm. what you can consider as a good standard. Because if we don't have the standard, it's difficult to, do, to say we are better. It's impossible to say I am better than the others when you don't know the, the baseline. The baseline is different in different countries, with different genetic strains, uh, in different environments. So these are things that we will need to have a look on. And when it comes to real measures, probably we need to improve our fast uh, uh, phenotyping, our uh, fast measure capacity, especially in the cost reduction. Uh, right now, it's possible to measure the quality of a fish, but it's expensive. It's a little bit too much expensive to run it on a daily basis uh, on every fish. So I think what we need to improve is how to get, and, and there are some tools we are working on here in TLL uh, mm. to, to, to better measure this in real conditions and to have um, a better definition of what is good and not good. And um, I was thinking about the, uh, some certification in France that exists in aquaculture. We now have 10 on La Belle Rouge which is a certification on quality. And they are constraining the farmers uh, on the product, on the taste, on the color, on the quantity of lipid, uh, but also on the farms, uh, which is certain density of production, usually a low density or duration of production that it should be a little bit longer. Altogether, mm -hmm. they part should, participate, should participate based to, the, to this regulation that is now in the law in France, uh, in the mm -hmm. regulation cycles. Um, uh, participate to the a better quality product. So at, at the end, it's probably a partnership that has to be uh, developed between farmers, uh, 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 local uh, uh, political organizations, uh, customers, and, and, and scientists to define what is a good quality and how to improve it. 
audience, we would like to hear from you again about aquaculture in post-pandemic world. Will traditional fish farms adopt new technologies and grow proteins sustainably? You have 10 seconds for this poll. Wow. <laughs> Predominantly, the answer from the audience is yes. Richard, what are some actionable steps for small-scale fish farms to take post-COVID-19? To help these small farms is, is a challenge. Uh, they are sometimes in a difficult situation. Um, uh, however, it's, it's important when we talk about sustainability to, uh, to, to compare to something again, uh, because you cannot be sustainable or not sustainable. Sustainability mm. is usually a combination of uh, environment, uh, economic, and social first. And if we, if we focus on the environment, which is usually what we do, uh, again, there are some uh, parameters we can use, like the quantity of CO2 uh, equivalent to a ton of production, the quantity of energy that we need to produce one product, uh, the quantity of phosphate that will give you an idea of some water pollution. There are many parameters, and I think it's important more and more to have, use this in our day-to-day -day life. When we say something is sustainable, is it more sustainable than this for this parameter? Because it's it was sometimes very confusing to to sell, take, say for example a small farmer that they they are not so sustainable compared to what sometimes they are very sustainable for some parameters so that's I think important for for us in when we talk about sustainability to be more precise it's our responsibility to communicate better with the with the customers I think and uh, for to I mean. I don't know if I have advices to, to give the small farmers because it's a very tricky situation and they already, I mean, they are used to this crisis usually and what they usually did in the past, especially in Asia, is diversification. And this is happening again, uh, diversification for species, diversification mm. for products like uh, services. If you go to a fish farm, you will be amazed to discover that they are selling many things to other farms, buying, uh, selling, uh, this is usually the way they can survive this uh, yearly crisis. We are having a crisis about pathogen right now, but trust me, shrimp industry had a lot and they had to endure a lot of crisis this way. So I think this diversification is, is important. Uh, um, and, and second one is what Andreas said is the connection with the customers. It's mm. a key if we want to help these farmers, we need to help them first so that they can help us after. And I think it's really important to have this in mind to say, if I want to maintain or to improve the production, local production, okay, let's start finding out who produced locally, uh, who can I help? And then these guys, they can, they can increase their, 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 their performances. They will be keen to that for sure. Andrews, back to you again. The young generation uh, is going to be even more discerning. First of all, they're much more digitally savvy. Uh, they'll 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 look at the use the internet to, to understand everything about the the different production where it's coming from. They'll also have a very strong, I would say, environmental consciousness. They will want to do what's what's right for the planet, and they'll go to great lengths actually to to make their their case uh, for any sort of supporting companies that are either certified or a document that, as you say, you know, so this is really a, a measure that's that, that's been used quite broadly now. I think certainly the. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, it's it's all relative, but uh, those companies that are at least you know showing in what ways are we doing things more sustainably will, will I think be the winners in, in, in the future. Um, I think also there will be a, a stronger degree of of, of you know of, of diversification. So uh, consumers will want not only eat uh, one type of fish. I think there as I think fish consumption is going to be more and more popular, which is all already what we're seeing. I mean, in, in an Asian context. It's been popular for many, many you know, thousands of years, but in the Western world, it's actually only uh, been, a, been a small part of the normal diet, but we are seeing that changing now as, as part of this whole green movement and eating and, and, and giving more sustainability. And I think as uh, consumers are becoming more used to eating fish and uh, a fish part of the diet, they'll start to ask you know, about, uh, about the variety and, 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 and eat not only salmon, not only, you know, but, but really a, a, a greater degree of, of, of high quality products. That's where I, th I, I see in, in Barramundi production, we, we believe we have a very good future because uh, Barramundi really has a lot of the same qualities uh, as salmon, uh, but it's a white fish, it's leaner, it's, 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 it's as nutritional, it has a high degree of, of omega-3, 
so I think it's, it, it'll be a good complement to, to, to the salmon, in, in the, at least in the Western part of the world, as it becomes more sort of uh, known. Demand for, for sustainability, for traceability, it's going to be not something that com companies can decide to do. I think it's going to be a requirement that in order to sell your products into certain supermarkets, uh, hotels, they would demand that you have a full uh, you know, sustainability profile and you, you can prove that your products are, are traceable. I don't think it's going to be very long before these, these requirements are coming up. What is really critical is that we start to look at the entire value chain. And that goes from, you know, how was the, what feed has been used? Uh, how was it produced? So it's not just what the fish farmer as, alone is doing. It's also whatever was incurred uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, carbon footprint in, in the process before and also after the fish has been farmed. So I think we really need to look at the end-to-end -end picture uh, as, as we think about you know, what's, what's really sustainable. Richard, do you have anything to add on that? I think this, this alternative uh, uh, feed is a key in the equation. Uh, we, we, we probably have to consider communicating better also this to customers and maybe through certification yeah. but also maybe through a we're talking a lot about blockchain right now in aquaculture. That there is a growing interest, and it's true that if a lot of information are now available to the to the world industry in really a short time, it opens the door to to more uh, data sharing. So it it requires more transparency. So it's a challenge for farmers, uh, but at the end, it's probably the opportunity to to distinguish who are the farmers you can rely on for quality and who the, the farmers you, you should be careful with. And I think it's when we target better uh, um, product for our health and our, for the environment, we will have to classify in a way or another, which should bring the world industry up. We have a booming population to feed. What are the priority areas of R&D in aquaculture to focus on? Are there silver linings in the fourth industrial revolution? What, are, what, are, what is important is probably to focus on what is available now, what can we use right now from the science in the fish industry, uh, in the aquaculture industry. There, there are many things I think that are readily available. Uh, the second thing I, I would consider is the, um, is the hardware. The hardware is uh, usually at the era of IoT, a little bit under considered. Uh, we, have, we will have AI and we will have blockchain and we already have in many places. Uh, however, aquaculture is a niche market with sometimes really limited margin. We need a reasonable cost material and, and hardware. And for that, it requires a specific development. Uh, if we go with the existing solutions, sometimes it's too expensive for, for farmers. So we probably need some effort, some work on this to develop easy to access uh, hardware for Southeast Asian farmers so that we can generate more data and then improve our system. I'm afraid of the limitation of that because the data can be a fantastic tool. However, it's a tool that is limited by the data uh, collection. If you don't have the data collection hardware, you have nothing. So I think this is important. And the, the last one would be the, um, I think the collaboration uh, as we're doing today uh, and we're also doing on, on, on a more regular basis, uh, basis in Singapore with the farmers. I think it's very important to have this communication uh, even if we are talking about rocket science that may be very super exciting, it's good to uh, place this in the right context and say, okay, is it really possible to apply even after 10 years, this will be the price? Okay, maybe it's not the right position. So I think it's very important to, to have this. And, um, and there are fantastic uh, startups and technology right now. There, there are, we have a, a precision uh, aquaculture department here and we are, are lucky to receive many startups uh, in the aquaculture environment uh, every week. It's, it's impressive. There are many exciting things uh, from alternative proteins, from uh, uh, sensors, from uh, AI. Uh, uh, these guys have, have very nice ideas, but again, that's important to uh, place them at the right place in the right conditions and, and, and maybe uh, correct a little bit the, the business model in a way that it's compatible with uh, small farms. And, uh, and, and sustainability, I mean, we were talking about that before. I think it, had, it has to be in our radar, uh, this uh, uh, life cycle analysis that I was mentioning before, when you, you look at parameters like energy consumption and, 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 and CO2. Again, if we want to, to define a baseline and to compare farms and, and systems and products, 
we will have, I think, to, to move a little bit this way. We have a few questions coming through the Q&A box. To place this in, a, in, a, in the market perspective, you need to bring a solution where there is a need. And uh, the need now of, for alternative protein is in markets where uh, there is higher consumption of fish meal without alternatives. Surprisingly, it's mainly carbs uh, these days, but, but probably it will evolve. If this is a question is how do I choose my species if I have a new protein? I think it would target, should, should be good to target the markets where the, the fish meal is still high. Uh, otherwise, I think for a lot of uh, aquatic species that we are working on right now, um, we know more and more uh, what is the benefit of some alternative proteins. Thanks to fine formulation tools, we can, uh, we can check what would be the impact of this or this. And something important also to consider is that uh, many of uh, species that have been raised for, let's say, 10, 20 years, they already reached quite good fit conversion ratio. For example, the, the, the genetic uh, strains of Bramundi we're working on together, uh, BA and, and, and us. Uh, is quite performant. I mean, it's quite high, quite very, very good fit conversion rate. So it's difficult to improve this. It's it's possible, but it's difficult. Uh, and uh, and based on this, it's uh, not only the feed, but also the, the way to use the feed that will be impactful. So that that's a challenge. Then I, mean, I think it's good for replacement to uh, target first similar performance. It's already good at a, at a similar cost. It's already fantastic. If this is achieved already, it's it's good. I believe very much in, in the future for both, you know, insect meal and uh, LGAs and the like. Uh, but of course, as a fish farmer, we have to be uh, very mindful of the costs and the performance. In our very high intensive business, the margins are extremely important. So if we were to lose, you know, X percentage of, of growth as a result of, of a different type of feed, it will have a tremendous impact on our, on our business. So I think the, the key is really to, to collaborate with the feed uh, producers to understand how is the, you know, the, the energy profile, the, the protein content, you know, how does that, that all play in? Uh, and, and more importantly, also ensure that the fish will be eating uh, the, the feed that is, that is given to them. Uh, I mean, we can probably, uh, I mean, think about genetics, we can probably select for certain fish that are, you know, more uh, susceptible to eating uh, different types of, uh, of, of feed, but we see that fish are not unlike humans, they, they are picky eaters as well. I mean, they, they don't eat just anything. So I think this is some, some of the things that people probably sometimes underappreciate that it's not just uh, something that that eat anything, we really have to uh, make sure that that it's being it's, it's being consumed in a in a way that is you know efficient for production so i think we, we still have a, a long way to go but i do think there's a lot of interesting projects and companies undertaking some of these very new technologies that I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing you know and trying that in in, in, in practice in, in the near future i agree i mean this is the, the this is exactly uh, the, the point the cost is is a key and uh, and yes the fish are picky when you when you feed them i mean it's it's impressive how the, the i mean you, you have the probably the feeling that uh, or the, the the image that it's uh, fish farming is just throwing some feed in a, in a cage uh, unfortunately it's not that easy and uh, sometimes you you don't understand why but it doesn't work <laughs> so it's mm -hmm. uh, it's more complex than this yeah It's highly necessary to do so because there is no chance the technology developed in Europe will be copy paste in the same way in Asia. It, it has been tried many times. It doesn't work this way. The, the purpose of uh, having precision farming done in the area is really to adapt the environment and the farms so that and maybe to recreate some things from scratch, unfortunately, but, but this is the only way to, to, be, to, to go, I think. Because uh, we are talking about very different environments and, and uh, the diversity of species in the world is crazy. In aquaculture, we're talking about 400 plus uh, diversity of sites is crazy. So at the end, the first question is where uh, the technology should be applied. In, in any industry, I mean, the first question you ask is, okay, is it a machine for a kitchen or a, a spaceship? And in our case, uh, we need to first look at this and then develop around. So yeah, I mean, the precision aquaculture should start from somewhere in Asia. I hope Singapore, and I think Singapore is on the good way to, 
to do it. I agree. I think it is true that Europe has somehow taken a, a lead uh, in, in so far when it comes to precision agriculture and, and really be on the forefront of technology. I think a lot of the resources has so far gone into the, the cold water species. So I do think there's actually a really great opportunity to tackle the sort of the, the, the tropical species in an Asian context. I mean, if you look at the tropical belt, I don't see any uh, region that has taken more interest in really becoming a, a, a hub for, for, uh, for, for tropical fish uh, than, than Asia. And I think in particular, I think Singapore has, has done a lot to, to become sort of the uh, the, the center of excellence for, for tropical fish. I mean, we have a, a number of both feed companies that are setting up uh, R&D labs. There's a number of startups. Uh, I mean, the, the Singapore government is also encouraging a, a lot of innovation to happen here. Uh, so I think this is also, I think it, it, it's really not, it's not about one company or, uh, or one startup doing it. It's about that, you know, c consortium of, of, of talent, you know, companies, uh, startups and the like that, that go together and really, you know, continue to push the boundaries for, for for what's possible. So, I think we already have have come quite a long way, uh, but I do think there's a, a strong opportunity for Asia to take a very meaningful role in the future of aquaculture. In particular, as we see that the, the tropical fish species will be a, a key growth factor uh, as we look, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ahead uh, for for aquaculture. We work very close, as I said, with with our feed suppliers on on and and the way the, the way we work is we we have a, a certain set of specifications where key for us is that that we we have to ensure that the the energy profile and the the, the, the whole sort of com composition of the feed is is adequate. We've done we've we've we have been working with with Barmundi for you know, more than you know, 10, 15 years in, in our different sites. So we know exactly what is required for the fish to, to achieve the best perform, performance and, and the best possible FCR. So we, we do need to be very strict with, with you know, the, the, the protein content, the energy content, the, the fatty acids, et cetera. Uh, having said that, there is a lot of flexibility in what uh, different components can actually make up of that composition. And that's really where we ask our feed suppliers to be very innovative and creative in, 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 in helping us to understand where are the different areas that we can improve uh, and change some of the you know, traditional uh, fish meal components with new and more innovative uh, components. So I think it's, it's certainly something that, that we, um, it, it's very close to our DNA. Also, as, as I mentioned, we, we want to be sustainable from an end-to-end -end perspective, not just in a, in a narrow uh, setting at, at, at the farm, but really looking at the, the entire uh, value chain. Yeah, it, it's definitely important. And uh, it's true that vaccination is not the answer to everything uh, right now. And many, um, many, successful works have been done uh, by uh, to boost the immunity of the of the fish and to uh, the problem is the pathobiome indeed it's to is to really understand what is the the, the population of of uh, of, of uh, pathogens that exist in a certain system first again to define the site the right site and when you know where the site there are ways to uh, boost this immunity against some disease. Uh, in CBAS, it's working quite well. Uh, and if, there is no, if this doesn't work, then the vaccine, uh, vaccines are a solution. Um, but it's true that the diversity of this pathobiome is yeah, most probably the, 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 the big challenge of, uh, of, of production right now, because you can work a lot uh, to, 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 to fight a, a disease in the place, even at the scale of industry. Uh, it will change uh, maybe in two years, and then you have to start all again from scratch. So it's true in other animal species. It's true in poultry. It's some, sometimes true in, in, in porcine. We have seen this recently. Uh, however, in aquaculture, there is a diversity and of sites uh, and interaction with pathogens that is very difficult to fight. And let's be honest, this is the first concern of every farmer on a daily basis. Disease. Uh, feed is important. That's true because it's cost. But uh, what makes you wake up on a good uh, mood or a bad mood is more the disease. And this is still challenging. So we, we are very proud in, in, to, to welcome a, a new team member soon in, in, in TLL 
working on this topic because we think it's very important. Uh, but uh, that's definitely, yeah, forever a, 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 a useful uh, uh, topic to tackle down in aquaculture. Thank you everyone for joining us today. See you soon.